Good day, everyone. I'm your host for today's webinar, Mike Lasecki. Our topic is multi-responsive nanogels for biosensing, drug delivery, and regenerative medicine. I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment, but let me remind you of a couple of things. This webinar will be recorded. In fact, I've turned on the recording and we'll send you a link automatically. Please use the chat window. That's on the middle right of your screen. And at the very end of the webinar, we'll have a brief survey. We want to hear from you to help improve these uh, webinars. So thank you for joining today. This webinar is hosted by ATE Central. ATE Central acts as the information hub for the National Science Foundation's ATE grantee community. You can find out more about AT Central and the webinars that they host at atecentral.net slash webinars. You can see the URL at the bottom of the screen. This webinar is brought to you by the National Coordinated Infrastructure Southwest at Arizona State University and the NAC Network at Penn State University. Thank you very much to our organizations for sponsoring this webinar series. Let me make some introductions today. On the left, that's me, Mike Lasecki. I'm your host for the webinar. I work at Luca Partners. Joining me in the background today is Shannon, our IT support person, and many of you have heard from Janet Pinhorn, our communications liaison for these webinar series. So thank you to both uh, Shannon and Janet for their production efforts. Also joining us today as an additional discussant is Uskar Kakmak. He's the assistant professor at Penn State University and a member of the NAC network. I, although I haven't shown his picture today because I wasn't exactly sure if Bob Ehrman was coming. Uh, uh, Bob Ehrman is the director of the uh, NAC network. Bob, would you come along and uh, say hi to everybody? Sure, thank, I wanna thank everyone for being here today and uh, thank you, Mike, for hosting and uh, thank you to, doc, uh, to uh, our presenter today. I'm. Uh, Really excited to uh, to hear his talk today. So thank you again for supporting this uh, this talk, and uh, thank you both for your work there. And uh, Dr. Kakmak, uh, I'll let him say something here for a moment, also. Good. Come on, Oscar. say hello, everyone. everyone. Hi, everyone. This is Osgur, and thank you, John, for giving us a talk today on this topic. All right. Cool. Let me go ahead and introduce our presenter now. Uh, joining us as presenter is John Clegg. He's a postdoctoral fellow in biomedical engineering at Harvard University. You can see his picture there. Uh, John, I'm looking at your bio. You, uh, you're currently a postdoc there at, uh, at Harvard, and you got your bachelor's of science in biomedical engineering from, from UC South Carolina and then master's and PhD from University of Texas at Austin. John, let me ask you a question. How'd you get into this yeah, field? Sure. What, what, what encouraged you as a young person to start down this scientific track? Sure, uh, so um, as I think many people who end up in bioengineering, biomedical engineering, I was really inspired to do to do something to improve medical systems and medical devices mm -hmm. and and so as a I don't know 16 year old or whatever person I didn't know anyone who did that and so I hit the internet and started googling who makes medical devices who makes new treatments new devices to improve medicine and actually found biomedical engineering on a college board website search Wow. And that was the start of going into biomedical engineering. Yeah, so That's it's great. it's a little it's a little arbitrary, but I was uh, really in, really wanted to contribute to making medicine better. But I knew that my interest really lied at inventing new inventing new things, coming up with new ideas, much more so than the day to day interaction with patients, as I think you would see in sure. on the clinical side. Well, thank you, John. Great story. As you say, all of us find our path somehow here, uh, so, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, John, go ahead and take us forward to, uh, right into the next slide in the start of your presentation. Great. Okay, thank you, and thank you to everyone who is joining us online today. 
Um, I'm going to be presenting on the synthesis and application of nanogels for a number of applications with specific case study in how we're using nanogels that we modify in a number of ways for a specific drug delivery application. And so the purpose of this webinar is to introduce you to environmentally responsive hydrogels with particular focus on the fabrication and application of nanoscale hydrogels or nanogels. And so in the beginning of the talk, I'm going to really dive into basically what is a hydrogel and why might we want to synthesize these at the nanoscale, and then also a little bit of how the thermodynamics uh, of how these networks behave in solvent give these environmentally responsive properties. So next, I've shown that these nanogels can be fabricated by a number of methods, and I'm going to be focusing on one where we synthesize uh, functional methacrylates with free radical polymerization, and we use orthogonal modification, meaning that we use chemical reactions which react off of the backbones of these nanogels um, without substantially chemically altering the ligands that we are coupling. And so that's how we're able to make these in a modular way. Uh, then, yeah, so we're going to go into the thermodynamics first, then, the, then one application, and finally, at the conclusion of the talk, I will give some examples of how nanogels are being applied by not just myself, but many others in this field for applications in protein biosensing, in drug delivery, and in regenerative medicine. And so first, just talking about the thermodynamics of gels. So one thing that's really unique about hydrogels is that you have these long chains of polymer that are hydri highly hydrophilic. Now, if they, if they were not cross-linked into a network, these long chains would, chains would dissolve in water, as it is a good solvent. But they are physically constrained by the cross-linking reaction. And so at certain extents of swelling, you are left with a, a real tension between the desire of these linear chains to further expand and interact with the solvent and the fact that there is an elastic force of them pulling on each other. And so in terms of the swelling of hydrogels or nanogels, you, um, you, you have these like nanoscale networks which, which are swelling up until, up until a point. And all of the systems that I'm going to talk about today are ionic. Now, what's interesting about them being ionic networks is that by changing the pH of the medium, for instance, you can change the protonation state of those ions. And actually, as you protonate or deprotonate, you might change the extent to which the, the linear polymers like to interact with water, the extent to which they're hydrophilic, and the extent to which they'll swell. And so again, the big takeaway I'd like you to take from this, from this slide is that, is that hydrogels have this unique property of being in this equilibrium between the elastic forces of the chains pulling on one another and how favorable it is for these chains to be interacting with the solvent. So again, in terms of on the molecular level, what this might look like is that you have a polymer which is happy to interact with solvent. And in response to a stimulus, it is no longer thermodynamically favorable to have all of those water polymer interactions. And so actually, your equilibrium shifts toward the polymer collapsing on itself, and we're having more polymer-polymer interactions and liberating those molecules of water to further diffuse away. And so you might imagine in a nanogel how one of these where I have a hydrated coil could be a linear polymer chain between cross-linking points. And then as I shift the pH or I shift the temperature of the medium, and as a result of that shift, the polymer water interaction is not favorable anymore, how that might collapse and lead to a dramatic shift in the volume of the nanogel. Also, in ways in which the nanogel and any analytes, such as proteins or small molecules, might interact. So what I'd like to show here, because the remainder of my talk does focus on pH responsive nanogels, is why we are so interested in materials that respond to physiological pH. And that's because a number of physiological locations, whether that be different organs, the stomach, the colon, um, or different, different 
uh, aspects of the cell uptake pathways, whether it's the extracellular environment within an endosome or being trafficked to a lysosome, that you have these gradients in pH. And if we can use these pH gradients as a trigger, we could get targeted delivery of payloads. So I have on the top left of the slide here, which I'll show with the pointer, I have here just a number of these pH environments. And then here in the bottom of the slide, I have what is quite a complicated looking equation. So what this equation does, which was derived by Brandon and Pepys, really shows you is how we can model mathematically the swelling properties of nanogels in response to pH as a function of conditions of the environment, such as the pH, the pKa, so characteristics of the ionizable monomer, and then a number of parameters of the hydrogel, for example, the m sub c, which is the molecular length, molecular weight between cross-linking points. Now, what I'm showing here on the right side of the slide are just some cartoon plots of how you might expect swelling behavior of an anionic versus a cationic nanogel. So in a, when you have a, a network which is in a charged state, so whether that is positively or negatively charged, that is going to increase its affinity for water and therefore increase the swelling. And so for example, if you have an anionic hydrogel, such as a polyacrylic acid, polymethacrylic acid, that hydrogel is going to be swollen when the pH is above the pKa, meaning the network is anionic in that case. On the other hand, if you have a cationic gel, such as a polyamine, you would expect that those gels would be swollen at low pH. Now, depending on your application, you may need an anionic or a cationic system. For example, in, um, in the PEPIS lab where I did my PhD, we worked extensively on anionic hydrogels for oral delivery because we wanted systems which in the stomach in an acidic environment were collapsed and could protect payloads such as proteins or small molecules and then when they get to the intestine would swell and release that payload. On the other hand in the same lab but different collaborators different systems what we did is develop cationic gels for intracellular delivery because we wanted something that in the circulation would be collapsed but once taken up into a cell and trafficking toward through the endosomal pathway you have a reduction in pH and that might release that payload intracellularly. And so you can think about how you would need actually different ionic systems for different intelligent functions. So here's just an example of some of those polymers that we, that we and others in the field use that can be natural or synthetic in origin. Again, with the key commonalities of that you have a highly hydrophilic, and in this case charged, imparting that pH responsiveness backbone cross-linked into a network with cross-linking agents. Um, and so again, where I, where I say cross-linked into a network with cross-linking agents, what I'm really talking about is this section down here where we depict that you can have these linear chains cross-linked into a network and that in response to stimulus, they can swell and dramatically change their volume. All right, and so with that, that's going to close the first very brief section of the seminar discussing the thermodynamics and applications of ionic nanogels. And again, from here is where I'll pivot and give much more detail on one specific application of nanogels, in this case for intelligent or responsive drug delivery. And so I'd be happy to take any questions at this time from, um, from the other presenters or the participants of the seminar um, who might want to have further discussion. You know, John, John, it's Mike. Um, I think I just had an aha moment there. I was wondering who cares if these nanogels swell or not, but then if I've got it right, your, your, uh, your agent that you're trying to deliver is, am I correct, trapped in the nanogel, and then as it goes to its target in the body, wherever that might be, if the nanogel swells, it would release the agent. I know that's somewhat simplistic, but, mm -hmm. but is that it? Yes, and so actually that, that especially for macromolecular payloads, such as like proteins and nucleic acids, that, that is exactly the hypothesis there, is that if we can make a carrier where uh, when the chains are quite swollen and spread apart, that payload can easily diffuse in and out but when collapsed, it's trapped. That's a way that we can protect it from the surrounding environment because the, that environment, whether it's uh, enzymes or a pH, 
uh, a, a rough pH will not actually permeate to the center of the particle. But when, when it reaches the target site in response to that pH and is able to swell, again, you're able to release that payload. So that is one case. I mean, another case is that as a result of swelling, you might present binding sites for subsequent cargo. And so, for example, in bios, you might think of in a biosensing application, I could have a nanogel that is, say, a part of a recyclable biosensor where I may want to collapse it to release the bound payload so that it could be reused again to, to again, rebind um, such molecules. And so, but I, I do pr particularly like to give the drug delivery example because I believe it, it's maybe one of the easiest to sink your teeth into of how you can have really dynamic properties of networks that give unique properties that allow you to deliver drugs in a new way, yeah. One of our colleagues for Penn State asked this question in the chat box, which you can see there, John. How, um, how what's the mechanism of that drug encapsulation? Sure, and so, in it, it I mean, this, the short answer is it it depends. Um, in some cases, p folks will use cross-linking reactions that can happen in the presence of the payload, in the presence of the drug. Um, in the case of the studies that I referenced. What we actually did was swell the network in a good solvent and partition the payload into it and then collapse it with that payload trapped. Mm -hmm. The advantage of doing it in that way is that you can take then your material through any number of processing steps which would potentially harm the payload, but, the, but where the polymer is quite stable. And you can really process and purify it in a very precise way and then load your drug after the fact. And so that's the real advantage of that method. Cool. Another question comes up for the oral delivery. Any um, issues that are related to the digestibility of, of those polymers that you're using uh, after, they, after dissolution, after their release? I mean, are there any residual effects? Yeah. So. The, now, in the system I referenced, that was a polymethacrylic acid copolymer cross-linked into a network with polyethylene glycol. And so these are both biocompatible but non-biodegradable polymers. Mm -hmm. so, what, so what you actually are dealing with there is that that part of particulate system we've shown it does not actually enter the, the circulation or into the tissue. It stays with the gastrointestinal tract and is actually cleared. Yeah, it, it may stay resident in the GI tract for some time on the order of maybe four, eight hours, four to eight hours, but it's not retained for days to weeks. Um, now, on the other hand, there are separate studies other folks may, may run with various different patch systems or things that actually adhere to the mucosa, and then those would, those have to degrade and so on. And so, again, like, it's a pretty diverse field in that regard, but, in the case of our systems, we're actually relying on that they are cleared through the GI tract and excreted without ever entering the tissue. Right. Okay, good response. Let me ask um, Uskar to come on. Uskar, do you have any questions for John at this point? Yeah, so uh, sorry for my naive question that it might sound, but I had two very short questions. The graph that you shown a few slides back with the pH axis. Go back to it, so, John. So, uh, would that be, is that like a theoretical uh, result or uh, of the equations or is it characterized with some characterization tool, this swelling? And the second thing is like, is this contrast of these ionic systems, like the slope of this pH and the pH scale, is that a figure of merit like for a hydrogel to give this kind of a quick response or not? Thank you. Oh, okay. Yes. So, so, uh, good, so good question. So, um, the plot shown there is on arbitrary units. However, in a few more slides in, I will show basically that same plot with experimental data from nanogels that I've synthesized, um, where in that case I, perf I quantify the swelling via light scattering. Um, on the other hand, what you were talking about with the breadth of that pH transition, so that is something we can actually tune with the, with the with the copolymers of interest, in general, you get a pretty sharp pH transition right around the pKa of that 
of the monomer. And so you will get a pretty sharp transition on the order of one to two pH units, but you can actually increase or decrease the, the breadth of that transition by copolymerizing with, with non-ionizable monomers. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, John, in the interest of, of time, we do have another question, but it's about the materials properties of the nanogels. I'm going to save that one till our next question break and ask you to take us forward um, into the presentation. Yeah, sure thing. Okay. And so what I'm going to be talking about here for probably the next 20, about 15 to 20 minutes is a very specific nanogel material that I've been working with for about the last five years. And so this nanogel is a copolymer of methacrylic acid, acrylamide, and methylene bisacrylamide. And so to point those out here, so you have your methacrylic acid, this has now your ionizable group, which is your carboxylic acid, and where the polymer form of methacrylic acid has the a pKa of about 4.8. Here you have acrylamide, so when I talked about a non-ionizable monomer, that's what I'm using here, being acrylamide as a non-ionizable, and methylene bisacrylamide, which is my cross-linking agent shown with the two, uh, two acrylamide groups, so these two polymerizable groups. So you can imagine that, and we're synthesizing these by inverse emulsion polymerization. So what that means is that these monomers are in tiny nanoscale droplets of water stabilized by surfactant in a continuous organic phase, in this case hexane. So the way we synthesize this is we initiate polymerization by introducing ammonium persulfate, which generates radicals, and forms a cross-link network then within these nanoscale droplets. Now those networks will have linear chains of acrylamide and methacrylic acid cross-linked together into a network with methylene bisacrylamide. Again, where the methacrylic acid group is what is giving you that response to pH, acrylamide is part of the copolymer, it gives structure and makes it hydrophilic, and the bisacrylamide cross-linking points. We purify them by precipitation in ethanol, uh, because in ethanol the networks are insoluble, so they collapse out, whereas they're quite colloidally stable in water, and exchange back into, wa into pure uh, ultra-pure water with dialysis. And so that, that's how these networks are formed. So now to show you, we, we did a study where we specifically looked at how much can we tune the diameter of these particles. Because you might imagine for different drug delivery and biological applications, the particle size is quite important. If you want that particle to be able to be taken up by a cell, you may need it to be on the order of uh, maybe a few hundred nanometers at most. If you want to inject it into circulation, have it circulate for some long time, you really want it to be 200 nanometers or less. Especially, you know, our long-term application here was targeted delivery to colorectal cancer. And so we wanted to potentially be able to take advantage of what's known as the enhanced permeation and retention effect. Uh, due to the leaky, leaky vasculature of tumors, and for that we needed them to be less than 200 nanometers. So we wanted the system to be broadly useful, but with our final application in mind, and so we wanted to know how much can we tune the diameter. So first we looked at the surfactant concentration, because we knew that would affect the micelle size, and indeed what we saw is we had a critical low surfactant concentration, that you had to be greater than that in order to form micelles, to form the emulsion polymerization in the first place, and after which you saw a decrease in particle size with increasing surfactant um, as it went further. Similarly, the ratio of the surfactants mattered because we needed a certain amount of bridge 30, which was a non-ionic surfactant as opposed to AOT, which was an ionic one, to get stable micelles. And as you increase the amount of monomer, so that being the acrylamide, methacrylic acid, and bisacrylamide in the inverse emulsion, you, as you might expect, increase the particle size. So the nice thing here is that we showed we can tune the diameter through a number of the design parameters. So now here are some of the plots that actually, I think, nicely respond to the question, which is to say, so we generated a number of these networks one that had cationic and anionic groups, and so it actually had a tertiary amine monomer in addition to the methacrylic acid. One that had no charge groups at all, so that's in the middle. That one just had acrylamide and hydroxyethyl methacrylate. And then anionic groups only, so this is my acrylamide methacrylic acid. And what we see is as we shift the pH environment, we get changes both in the hydrodynamic diameter, as shown by dynamic light scattering, and also the zeta potential, which is a measure of the apparent surface charge of that nanomaterial. 
And so, for example, in the particles that have both anionic and cationic groups, you see in the red plot, which is the zeta potential, that it's cationic at low pH, where those cationic groups and the, and the methylic acids are both protonated, so you have positively charged and neutral. So again, you have positive, you go through a transition point where you cross over neutral and then become anionic thereafter, and there are corresponding changes in diameter. Now, the easiest plot to dive into is the acrylamide methylcholic acid, where you see right here around the pH critical point of 4.8, you see a pH transition where you increase in diameter as you become more neutral, decrease as you become more acidic. And again, when you look at the zeta potential or apparent charge, as you are two pH points approximately below the pKa, you approach a neutral of zero surface charge. And as you, as you increase the deprotonation by titrating through the pKa, you become more and more anionic. You know, why does this matter? Again, that change in charge is giving you this swelling behavior. It's also going to change the way that you complex payloads, when those payloads may or may not be charged themselves, and we'll get into that. So within the acrylamide methylcholic acid network specifically, we showed we could tune the extent of the pH response. And so, for example, by changing the amount of the acidic monomer, uh, the methacrylic acid in this case, we showed that we did not substantially change the magnitude of the pH swelling. On the other hand, when we changed the bisacrylamide, so we changed the amount of cross-linking agent, we dramatically changed the magnitude of the swelling response. When you have less cross-linking agent, you get a much greater volume swelling. And again, this can be expected by the fact that the cross-linking points in those networks are further apart. And so as the pH shifts and they're able to swell, you can imagine how they would be able to swell to, to expand to a much greater volume without pulling on those cross-linking points. Whereas here, where we had a much higher extent of cross-linking, that they would expand to a much lesser extent before pulling on the cross-linking points. So, yeah, so, that, so that's that. And then like pivoting into biomedical applications, we wanted to know are the nanogels cytocompatible, and, and is their physical behavior reversible? And indeed they are. As shown on the left, the pH response to swelling and collapse is reversible as we titrate up and down into two model cell lines, fibroblasts and macrophages. We were able to dose the cells up to five milligrams per milliliter. That's 0 0.5 weight percent and is a very large dose uh, without seeing any reduction in the metabolic activity, which is a measure of toxicity. And so, to, to kind of have a take home moment here, in the development of this acrylamide methacrylic acid system, we now know we have a nanogel which is cytocompatible, undergoes a reversible pH response, um, and again is able to respond to the environment. And so what we really wanted to do now is say, okay, we have this platform, it appears to potentially be useful for medical applications, but if we now want to be able to use this for precision medicine, and so to be able to treat cancer or other diseases in a patient-specific manner, how can we customize these nanogels in a manner that is far more advanced beyond just a simple pH response around pH 4.8? And so we went into that. Sorry, I, I forgot I had this slide. This is a slide that depicts the nanogel uptake by macrophages. So we incubated fluorescently tagged nanogels with, with mouse macrophages and looked at uptake over the course of six hours. And we saw both a time and dose response uh, via fluorescent microscopy, which showed us that the nanogels were being taken up by the mirror macrophages. And again, I showed on the previous slide, we could dose up to five mg per mil for 24 hours without a change in metabolic activity. So we knew at this point that these cells could be packed full of these nanogels without affecting their metabolism, without leading to cell death. So that was promising for thinking that we could use these nanogels for biomedical applications. So now I'm saying, so to pivot this into precision medicine, we wanted to know, is there a way in which we can modify these nanogels in a precise manner that could be customized to specific patients? And for that, we incorporated this idea of modularity into the nanogels. And so I'm going to step through this figure because there is a lot here, but it is important to understanding what will come up in the following slides. And so again, we have the same system components, or acrylamide methacrylic acid polymer backbone cross-linked with bisacrylamide. What we looked at here is what if we modified the surface with tyramine, which contributed an aromatic group, or dimethylethylene diamine, which contributed a tertiary amine group. 
Now, if we modify the polymer uh, bulk with either of these, what we're left with is a network which has a combination of anionic and hydrophobic, or anionic and cationic. That will give us different pH response, could give us different drug loading and release properties, as well as different interactions with cells. And in fact, that is what happened, and I'll show you in the following slides. Um, another aspect is, and this is kind of into an earlier question, was this, because it's cross-linked with bisacrylamide, is non-degradable. What if we wanted to use these for intracellular delivery and make them biodegradable? So we incorporated a cross-linking agent that has a disulfide, which can be reduced in the intracellular environment to see if we could make the nanogels biodegradable specifically in the intracellular environment. Our ligands gave different pH responsiveness, drug loading and release, and cell uptake behavior. Also, we showed that as a result, specifically with this tertiary mean modification, can precipitate gold nanoparticles, which transduce light into heat for photothermal ablation therapy. So you can now think about how you have a single nanogel, which is useful in a number of ways, for pH responsive loading and release of drugs, for targeting cells, and for ablating cells with heat. Finally, for incorporating a patient specificness aspect, we looked at saying, can we incorporate cell targeting proteins, peptides, or enzymes into the nanogel via, again, these orthogonal reactions to target cells? And so in the coming slides, I'm going to step through and show you each one of these modifications in sequence and how they might be useful in colon cancer therapy. So here first, the biodegradation. So we were successful in incorporating this bisacroyal cystamine crosslinker. And again, what these plots show you here in quite some data, but the schematic makes it more clear, is at time zero, you have these networks which are small and insolvent. But then as you add these reducing agents, in this case glutathione, which is present in the intracellular environment, 10 millimolar, or dithio 3 all, which is a reducing agent used in many biological experiments and applications, what you do is you compete for those cross-linking points. As those cross-links degrade, the networks simultaneously degrade and swell. And so we would know that we're getting this bulk degradation mechanism where we're competing for cross-linking points, and at that case, getting degradation, if and only if we see simultaneously a reduction in polymer mass and an increase in diameter. And so here, that's indeed exactly what we see. So the particle count, as shown through count rate on DLS, uh, DLS being dynamic light scattering, as well as the hydrodynamic diameter shown by light scattering. As we see a decrease in the particle number, we see along with it an increase in volume, showing that we are in fact getting this competition for crosslinks leading to both degradation and swelling. We took that time, we took that degradation in multiple reducing agents out to about one hour and, and saw complete degradation of the nanogels uh, in the presence of dithio 3 at all in just 40 minutes. And in the presence of glutathione, it took two days, but we did see complete degradation. Okay, so now moving at, moving on. So this is another method we use to to dial in on the on the biodegradation, and so we used a novel quartz crystal microbalance assay where we immobilized the nanogels on the surface of a gold quartz sensor, and monitored the degradation in real time by looking at both the viscoelastic properties of the layer of nanogels on the sensor as well as the mass bound of the sensor. And so we actually just published on this method if you're interested, and I'm also happy to take questions on the topic. Um, but yeah, but so here here is an example on the left of your non of, of non-degradable nanogels with bisacrylamide, and on the right, degradable nanogels with our bisacryl cysteine crosslinker, showing that when the reducing agent was infused, we saw no substantial change shown here in blue in the absorbed mass. Um, but as shown here with the degradable crosslinker, we see a dramatic reduction in the absorbed mass shown by an increase in quartz resonance frequency. And again, this is just the main takeaway here, because I know this is a very niche method to our, um, to our particular field, is just to take away that we were able to successfully degrade the nanogels and that there are a number of methods, whether they be optical or gravimetric, to quantify the degradation of these materials that are at the nanoscale. Yeah, so we made small molecule modified nanoparticles, again, with the tyramine, dimethylethylene, diamine, or 
uh, modification. In this case, tyramine, the aromatic is in green, dimethyl ethylene diamine, the cationic is in red. And so we showed that we could modify the nanogels to different extents and that the different extents of modification change the pH responsive properties. So shown here, this is another one of those light scattering plots where I showed diameter. And so as you can see, the unmodified and the tyramine modified in blue and green still retain that pH responsive collapse. The gels that have both the anionic and cationic groups actually lose that pH responsiveness. And then the zeta potential or the apparent charge, we get a charge switch from anionic to cationic in both the groups modified with tyramine or dimethylphalene diamine, whereas the unmodified uh, only approach zero. They ne never make that switch over to cationic. So in terms of how these anion to cationic shifts in response to the pH affect the loading and release of payloads, we used methylene blue as a model therapeutic agent. Methylene blue is a photosensitizer, but it's also very similar in properties to 5-fluorouracil, which is a chemotherapeutic agent. And so as you can see here in the bottom plot, at pH 4.5, um, which again is where you start, you, de you protonate those methacrylic acid groups, it approaches a neutral charge, or in the case of the two modified gels, it becomes cationic. You, uh, you see a dramatic shift where the, the gels that switch to cationic release the payload almost immediately. See about 80% release in 15 minutes, as opposed to much more sustained release by the gels which are still anionic. On the other hand, at pH 7.4, more indicative of of a circulation pH, and also where all the systems are anionic, you see differences, but they are not nearly as pronounced as the 4.5 case. And so you might think how the unmodified nanogel does not give you a whole lot of responsive release. The profile is quite similar in both conditions. On the other hand, the gels in red, which have the cationic modification, release quite rapidly in both conditions and the ones with the aromatic modification give more sustained release at 7.4 and rapid at 4.5. And so the release there is more responsive. So again, you get diverse profiles of release. We used a high throughput imaging method uh, using fluorescent imaging on a Citation 3 microplate reader to look at cell uptake of the nanomaterials. Uh, and so again, using this technique enabled us to look at the uptake of multiple nanomaterials, the ones with all these different modifications in many cell types. And so we looked at colon carcinoma cells, fibroblasts, and macrophages. So there's a lot of information on this slide, but what I'd like you to take home is that on the left side here, you have colon cancer cells, and on the right, you have macrophages. And so from top to bottom, you have the unmodified, the tyramine modified, and the cationic dimethylethylene diamine modified. Uh, left to right, you have decreasing time. And so in the case of the colon cancer cells, you see that cationic modification dramatically increased the nanoparticle uptake as evidenced by the green fluorescence. On the other hand, in the case of the macrophages, these different modifications did not substantially affect the impact of the green fluorescence in the uptake. And this is quantified on the right, showing that in the case of the colon cancer cells, we have a dramatic increase in uptake as a result of that cationic modification. On the other hand, in the case of the macrophages, we see a small increase, but that's only really seen at 24 hours. For the first eight hours, we see no difference. And so you might think of how for a cell targeting application, you may want to use this cationic modification because it promotes more substantial uptake in your colon cancer cell as opposed to those other two model cell lines being macrophages and fibroblasts. So showing now the photothermal therapy, we successfully precipitated the gold nanoparticles. The way we're able to do this is the dimethylethylene diamine group is, acts as an intrinsic reducing agent. So it reduces gold chloride salt into gold nanoparticles under heating and mixing. In the TEM image, you see these gold nanoparticles as solid black dots within actually these dimmer shaded uh, spheres, which are the nanogels stained with urinal acetate. And as you can see here, we irradiated solutions of these nanogels with a 532 nanometer laser, uh, which was right around its max absorbance. And we saw that with just a one mg per mil, so that's 0 0.1 weight percent solution, we could heat a solution of PBS or water 10 degrees C in less than one minute. 
Now, what that translates to for a biological application is that if you can heat a cell from just 37 Celsius to even in the in the you know, 42 degrees or higher, um, in these like in these low heated conditions, you can increase the fluidity of that cell membrane and promote cell death of that cell. And so again, we we have not done this work in our lab, but many others work on this photothermal ablation of cancer, and it relies on this concept that if you can heat those cells, that you can get targeted killing of them. The last piece of this story is making peptide and protein conjugates. And again, I talked about is how this could be used to increase very patient or cell specificity to the nanogels. And so again, a lot of things here, but I'll step through it. We have an, an orthogonal reaction where through a sequence of two steps, uh, we can add a cysteine-containing peptide to these nanogels, first by adding this linker, which puts a malayamid group and using click chemistry to add this thiol-containing peptide to the malamid group. Alternately, if it's not a thiol-containing peptide, we can just use a single reaction, you, uh, which is a zero-length cross-linking catalyzed by EDC to activate this carboxylic acid and react with the N-terminal amine of a peptide to put that on the backbone. What I show here is that we successfully incorporated a range of model peptides that were cationic, anionic, or neutral into the nanogels, and that you could step up the extent of peptide conjugation just by changing the amount of peptide in the reaction. And so here, for instance, I show that you can get these nanogels up to 10 weight percent peptide just by increasing the amount of peptide in the modification reaction. Now, again, that is helped. The fact that I can get up to 10 weight percent is helped by the fact that the nanogels um, have many methacrylic acid groups. It was about 25% of their backbone was methacrylic acid, and the weight of a single peptide is more than 10 times that of a methacrylic acid group. And so this here, which is giving me 10 weight percent in the final dry polymer, is actually only modifying about 1% of the polymer backbone. So anyway, I, I know I throw many numbers there, but um, we take advantage of the fact that the peptides are much larger than the methacrylic acid groups to get such high loading. Here we conjugated two model proteins, horseradish peroxidase and wheat germagglutinin, just to show that indeed when conjugated to the nanogels, they retain their enzymatic activity. Here in wheat germagglutinin's ability to reduce to uh, convert its enzyme uh, substrate to product, and here, or sorry, the HRP's ability to convert substrate to product, and here the wheat germagglutinin's ability to stain fibroblast membranes. We chose fibroblasts here because the nanogels don't bind to fibroblasts, and so we knew that if we saw nanogel association, it was because of the wheat germagglutinin, not because of the nanogel, and indeed we did see that. So, so again, to kind of step through here, what we've shown is we have a base nanogel, it's biocompatible, we can dose cells with it at a very high concentration for quite a long time without significant negative effects, and through just a couple of modifications, we can make these nanogels act as a functional enzyme, we can make them target cells, we can have them retain the activity of an adhered peptide, we can also get cell targeting and pH responsive drug delivery through the uh, small molecule modifications, we can enable photothermal therapy, and we can get biodegradation in the intracellular environment. And so what started out as a pretty basic story, which is how do these nanogels respond to pH, how do they swell, how do they collapse, now you can see with just a, a short range of chemistries where we modify that surface with different groups, we're able to get a wide range of properties which could be leveraged then for precision medicine. So last piece here, how might we come up with these peptides? We've used molecular docking here to do that. But moving forward, we actually just went ahead into the literature and identified a peptide, the CC9 peptide, which has been shown in vivo to target colon cancer in a mouse model. And so we went ahead and conjugated this peptide to different extents to our nanogel and indeed showed that by increasing the amount of that peptide, we not only increase targeting but increase cell uptake by these uh, colon cancer cells. And so here, going from an unmodified nanogel, just nanogel with a fluorophore, no peptide, up to 10 weight percent CC9 peptide, you see that we get dramatically more green fluorescence in the cytosol, showing that these nanogels are now getting into the cell, which could be useful, again, for intracellular delivery of chemotherapeutics. 
All right. So I know I really moved through a lot of information there, and I hope that was able to tie it back to keep it relevant and interesting. And I'm happy now to take any questions specifically about these modular nanogels. After these questions, I will then summarize taking this out broadly to talk about how nanogels are being applied in biosensing, drug delivery, and regenerative medicine. Thank you, John. Uh, it's Mike. A couple of questions have come up. One is <clears throat> when these nanogels encapsulate a, a payload, you use that word as a cool word. Um, if it's water soluble in the nanogel as porous, does it, how does it protect that payload? Is, do, you, do you see the sense of that question? Yes, absolutely. And so, um, and again, this comes down to the composition of the nanogel. You see in my acrylamide methacrylic acid case, we get, we get release from the nanogel in both the swollen and collapsed states. And so, in this case, the payload is not truthfully being protected in a sense, more so that just the transport properties of it being either retained or eluded shift in response to the pH environment. On the other hand, um, I could reference like a number of papers, most of them using ca um, cationic nanogels, which have hydrophobic components as well, that undergo a much more significant response in terms of in their collapse state, they are quite collapsed, where even those small molecules are entrapped. Now, the example I gave of the methacrylic acid system for oral delivery, there you're talking about protein payloads, which are going to be quite large. Um, for example, uh, you could have anything from insulin, which is a quite, which is pretty small. You know, maybe maybe a nanometer in diameter, up to most growth factors, or maybe three, four nanometers in diameter, or an antibody which could approach 10 nanometers in diameter. And that's just for one molecule of the payload. So it can actually become quite entrapped in these pores, even though they are nanoscale. Yeah, that makes sense. You had a question. You mentioned using dynamic light scattering. Is that the way you characterize the size of these things? Like you say, you've got a 200, nano, yes. 200 nanometer nanogel, you do that by light scattering. Yes, that's correct. And there are a number of ways to, to characterize particle size. The reason why I like to use dynamic light scattering is because, is because it can be done in water, you know, in water in the presence of salts. Um, for example, if you wanted to use some sort of electron microscopy to do the same imaging, you would not be able to get these dynamic measurements where you're titrating in the pH in water and in real time measuring the sure. change in diameter. Now, for example, though, I have also done these studies with the quartz microbalance, where you can actually look at the change in absorbed mass as those nanogels imbibe water and swell. Um, and what, what's fun about the quartz microbalance is that, whereas in the case of light scattering, to get a a good measurement, many replicates, you might take up maybe one to five minutes, uh, collect one to five minutes of data. The sampling rate on the quartz microbalance is less than a tenth of a second. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I did the quartz microbalance study, I was actually able to monitor the swelling in real time and, and be able to say quite precisely that these swelling transitions happen in less than one minute. Yeah, and so you could really hone in on not just the magnitude of the transition, which light scattering shows you very well, but also the kinetics. Yeah, John, I was reading recently about these applications of these quartz crystal microbalances for studies like this one. It's pretty fascinating. We should do a webinar sometime just on that technology. I think it's an older technology been around for a long time, but it, it's really emerging as an interesting characterization tool, isn't it? Yeah, well, especially in the biomedical space, where you know we realize more and more that these surface phenomena on nanomaterials, implants, what have you, are are so amazingly important um, that all of a sudden these you know technologies which are really good at characterizing these surface these surface interactions, these surface phenomena, are kind of making their way into the biological space. And so, yeah, I. I became really excited about the quartz microbalance because I was interested, and this is a whole separate paper that is that I did not really cover in this particular webinar, but it could be a whole separate discussion. 
where, say, well, in a single experiment, can you look at one nanogel or, you know, one surface covered with thousands of thousands to millions of nanogels yeah. and quantify the swelling, the adsorption of proteins and the biodegradation in, in series. And, you, and in fact, you can because it's not a destructive technique until you get to the degradation portion. Sure. And so in a single experiment, to be able to quantify all those properties of the nanogels ended up being reasonably powerful. Good thing. And actually, that paper was written on this acrylamide methacrylic acid system. Yeah. Let's turn to our colleague, Uskar. Uskar, do you have a question for John? Yeah, very small question uh, and another probably naive question about the gold nanoparticles and um, your, uh, the, these nanogels, uh, they're used as like similar like in a surfactant uh, to nucleate these gold nanoparticles. Did I get it right? And if so, the different concentrations gave different uh, time response, I mean, in terms of the temperature. Does it also change the nucleation diameter of the nanoparticles too? I see. Yeah. So I, so I, so I, so I, yeah. so I should, yeah. I should, I should, I should, be, I should be clear, I should be clear with my, uh, with my uh, articulation here, um, which is that the concentrations shown here are concentrations of uh, dimethylethylene diamine modified acrylamide methacrylic acid nanogels with precipitate gold nanoparticles um, in water. That being said, all of them were synthesized in the same way. So you need a certain critical concentration of the dimethylethylene diamine moiety to facilitate the nucleation of the gold nanoparticles. So, and that was a whole separate experiment that we did which showed that in fact, you needed a pretty high extent of modification just to get any gold precipitation in the first place. Um, and then there were some optimized conditions in terms of heat and time to get gold nanoparticle precipitation. So this here was shown was just one formulation, the one with the highest extent of cationic modification with the, with amongst the most gold precipitation that we were able to get. And the concentrations shown on the plot in C, that's concentration of all components. So that's nanogel and gold, concentration in water. Yeah, I see, thank you. So uh, also the, uh, the error bar in many of those zeta potential uh, graphs that you've shown, is that mainly because of the, just like you said, because of the non-real time response of the, uh, DLS, or what would you say about that? Um, uh, so not exactly. So, so the the the, re the reason for the error bar is because, and and it's because of what I'm presenting as the error bar, right? These nanogels, uh, by the way they are synthesized, they are relatively uniform, but they're not identical. And so, what you actually have when you think about a solution is not say millions, billions, trillions of identical nanogels, but a distribution. And the and so what I'm showing by that error bar is actually the breadth, so the standard deviation of the distribution of goal of uh, nanogels. So that's what that error bar represents. Um, no, actually the the DLS measurement is is almost identically reproducible, and so take three replicates, take three replicates, three replicates gotcha. and be plus and be plus or minus um, maybe one millivolt uh, of zeta potential, like very precise measurements with the DLS. And so the the source of the error is actually variation in the distribution of nanogels. John, thanks for the response to those questions. Why don't you go ahead and take us up into the summary, and we might have time for one more question at the end. Great. Okay. And so to conclude here, I said we've made this polyacrylamide comethacrylic acid nanogel. We can modify it in a number of ways. Uh, we can tune the extent of modification both with peptides but also the small molecules by changing the mass fraction of free peptide or small molecule in the modification medium. And we increase targeting of colon cancer cells by 310% by adding 10 weight percent of the CC9 peptide. And along the way, we developed some new techniques 
uh, QCMD technique as well as the high throughput assay. And again, I'd like to refer you to the papers cited on those slides for full details on both of those methods, which were kind of invented along the way. What I'd like to finish with is just a brief discussion of how others are using nanogels for a variety of applications. And we recently wrote a pretty exhaustive review on this topic in progress in material science. But where we talk about here, I spent about one hour talking about how nanogels respond to pH and concentration of ions, as well as very briefly redox in terms of the degradation of the disulfide crosslink networks. But there are also nanogels that have been invented by other groups which respond to temperature, electrical stimulation, magnetic fields, lights, proteins, nucleic acids, and many other stimuli. And then beyond just having materials that respond to these stimuli, there are diverse fabrication methods for how you might be able to make these materials into, for example, nanoparticles, networks, tubes, sheets, implants. And so really, we are at a stage in this field of responsive and multi-responsive materials where we're only limited by our resources and our creativity. Um, and so this is a little bit of maybe a call to further excitement for the development of more of these systems. Just a, briefly the way some of these are being applied here in the slide, this is an example of a polynipam comethacrylic acid hydrogel synthesized on the surface of silica gold nanoshells. Um, and so this was done by Heidi Culver and Marissa Wechler. And what they showed was that, that these nanogels were, uh, were actually quite sensitive to protein concentration, in this case, lysozyme and lactoferrin. Um, and could actually be used as protein biosensors. And so where these, where these nanogels had such high affinity for these proteins that they were able to detect, grab them out of, sol out of solvent, hold them close to that gold nanomaterial, and that gold nanomaterial then transduced a visible signal. Um, on the, this is also where I talked about earlier in the slide how you maybe end, would end up using the responsiveness to change the pH to alter the affinity that that solute would have for the nanogel. Uh, we've also, in, in the lab, used these nanogels as components of modular scaffolds for tissue regeneration. And so, for example, here we show how these nanogels, which could be used to sequester and deliver growth factors, could be the component one component of a pretty complex scaffold for tissue regeneration, which takes into account engineered cells as well as extracellular matrices, biodegradable components, um, or other types of lichens. The last piece, and this is in the vein of tissue regeneration, is the development of soft actuators. And so this is something that I'm really excited about, which is the idea of designing materials from the ground up. So designing materials from the molecular scale all the way up to making rational assemblies via various fabrication techniques and embedding cells so that you can get systems that have really intelligent functions. And so one example I show here is, um, we highlight in the review, although this is not our work, are where smooth muscle, smooth muscle cells were embedded into intelligent materials that also contained uh, a metallic component which could conduce, conduce, uh, transduce an electrical signal so that you could actually get structures which the electrical activation makes the smooth muscle cells contract and you get um, very, very strong mechanical actuation of that signal through the cells, again, where the material acts as a scaffold to hold everything together in a unique geometry. And so while this is not a nanogel, this is a hydrogel, I, I like to include it to kind of stir imagination over how these materials that respond to environment in combination with complex geometries and also cells can do things that are really unique um, that existing devices do not do. In summary and conclusion of the talk, this is a figure actually taken from the review that I've referenced a few times in the last slides where I diagram out how I and how others think about designing these systems. And so to thinking about them from a uh, bottom-up design where we start at designing the material and the interactions of that material with environment to get intelligent behavior which can modulate a cell 
or thinking from the top down, starting with target cells and how you might like them to perform, thinking about what intelligence or transducing behavior you need out of a scaffold material, and designing that material from that. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to, to reference the paper and to dig into the figure, which will also be given in the slides that are posted. So in conclusion of the talk, the thermodynamics of polymer solvent interactions lead to interesting and useful properties, which I've shown that we can leverage for medical applications, including sensing, a lot of focus on drug delivery, and also in regenerative medicine. Um, yeah, and then through rational design, combining these components with also cells and other things, uh, we can make novel formulations for these various applications. So yeah, the in here, this drug delivery application was used as a case study for, in case, my investigation into cancer precision medicine. And again, in that case, we showed how in a single nanogel we could make it uh, target cells, degrade in a tunable way, and release a target, uh, release a model therapeutic in a controlled way. I hope that these types of materials can address unmet healthcare needs in the future. And so with that, I believe I've used the time uh, to its fullest. Um, but I encourage you all, if you've heard things that interest you today, um, here's my email address as well as uh, Feel free to connect with me on Twitter. This work was funded by the National Science Foundation in a graduate fellowship to, to myself, as well as project funding through National Institutes of Health, uh, Cockrell School of Engineering, and the UT Portugal Foundation. I'd like to acknowledge this work was done at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, even though I'm now at Harvard University in the School of Engineering. At the bottom left here, this is my a uh, small team from the University of Texas that did the work, as well as the lab of Nicholas Pepys, uh, where I worked at UT Austin. So thank you very much for your attention, and if there's time for any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Excellent, John. Thank you for uh, a very encompassing presentation. <clears throat> I'm going to ask Bob Ehrman to come on for just a second. You know, Bob, I'm, I'm convinced uh, these nanogels, they can do anything. They can encapsulate a large amount of, of payload, they can deliver it to the cell, they can get out of the way, they can release it at the right time, they can be activated by external photosources to create thermal reactions. It's a very cool system, uh, don't you think, Bob? Absolutely, Mike. This is fascinating, fascinating work, and I really thank Dr. C Dr. Clegg for his work here and for taking the time to present to our uh, NAC community. We really, really appreciate you. Uh, uh, being here and uh, sharing your work. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. No, thank you. It was, it was a pleasure to be invited, and I, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. We certainly did. We're right at our time. Your timing was perfect today, John. I'll just want to take people forward one slide, if I could. Uh, remember, folks, that we, we're going to uh, send you a link to the recording of this and, and the slides so you can see all the reference materials therein. Uh, John, one last comment. I was reading about this topic. Um, you think you could encapsulate, I mean, that's, I'm not sure that's the right word here, uh, both diagnostic and therapeutic th uh, capability into a nanogel? Has anyone ever done something like that? Yes, and so, in, in fact, folks actually um, combined the two words and called them theranostic platforms. It's a, it's a whole debate whether 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 theranostics is a thing or not, or if it's kind of an invented word, um, but but the idea is exciting, right? Um, can a material act as an actuator of a of a, as a uh, an actuator where it takes a disease signal and turns that into a therapeutic intervention? Uh, or conversely, could you have one material which you inject? where it provides some in information to a clinician, whether that's providing contrast on a medical image or um, generating a new biomarker, which might be detected in blood or urine, something like that. So where a single material could act in that diagnostic way and also simultaneously deliver a therapy. Wow. You know, that, that so from an academic point of view, I mean, it can be done. I mean, the, the question comes from a clinical point of view if the complexity is merited. Sure. Is it better to have one system which does two things or 
two systems <laughs> that each do one thing but could be administered at the same time if necessary. Sure. And I think that I think that's a question for um, for people who understand that clinical application better than I to really address. But from an academic point of view, you know, can you include contrast or other uh, types of diagnostic agents and therapeutic agents simultaneously? Uh, we haven't done it, but others have shown you can. Cool. John, thank you again. I, I, I myself enjoyed the presentation very much. I know our colleagues did. We appreciate your response to the questions, too. John, this ends officially the webinar. What I'm going to do right now is launch the survey for, for those of you online. It will appear in a, another window. Some older Mac operating systems don't allow that, and I'll put the link to the survey into the uh, question window as well. So, John, thank you again. You can go ahead and, and sign off. I'm going to launch the survey right now. So thank you, everybody. All right, uh, great. We'll leave the system open for another couple of minutes while you complete the thing. John, goodbye. Uh, Uskar, Bob, thank you again for joining today. Goodbye, everyone.